everyone. Thank you for um, showing up, as it were, uh, taking time out of your days to watch me and listen to me at a computer. OK, so uh, I'm going to be talking today about some work that I have done and others have done um, using glacial earthquakes and looking at uh, glaciers in Greenland um, using seismology. And so uh, just a lot of, there's a lot of people doing really interesting work that I'm not going to cover here. Um, because they can speak better to their own work than I ever could. So I encourage you to uh, show up at some cryoseismology sections. There's going to be a pretty exciting one at SSA. Okay. So um, just sort of to start things out, um, for those of you who are not totally ensconced in the cryosphere world, why do we actually care about what's happening in Greenland? Um, and there's a lot of reasons, but the short answer is that when we look at Greenland, it's the site of a lot of rapid changes. Uh, so what we're looking at here is just a plot um, using gravity to look at the mass loss or the mass change over time in Greenland. And so what we're talking about here in terms of mass is ice that's melting. So it's a pretty simple plot here um, that just you can see here's time and mass and we're losing mass over time. So basically we're losing ice from Greenland in a pretty rapid way. And so we're trying to sense, you know, understand how is this affecting glaciers? How is this happening? What is the effect on the dynamics of the glaciers? In an effort to understand glaciers, but also in an effort to understand better how they're going to behave in the future. At the same time, we're losing all of this mass in Greenland. We're also seeing these rapid changes taking place along the coast of the glaciers. And uh, this is a older reference now, I guess, 2008, but it's still very good. It's basically, uh, this paper looks at a large number of outlet glaciers in Greenland and is trying to say what glaciers are in retreat, which means they're moving upstream, they're sort of becoming shorter, essentially, um, and what glaciers are advancing. And so you'll notice here that you see a lot of red and yellow dots. Uh, this is, each of those red and yellow dots is the terminus of a glacier. Um, where the ice sheet flows into the ocean, or in a couple cases, oh, sorry, they're not listed here. There's some cases where it doesn't reach the ocean. But anyway, so all of these red and yellow dots are where glaciers are retreating. So you can see there's a lot of glaciers retreating in Greenland. So we're losing a lot of mass, that's ice melting away, and we have a lot of glaciers retreating. And so we want to understand what's happening with these glaciers, what's happening in Greenland. Okay, so. Uh, one of the ways we've done some of this is by looking at these long period glacial earthquakes. So glacial earthquakes have been identified for some number of years now, um, but they first came to our attention. Well, I say our, as in our group, I was not involved then, but our attention um, as these large earthquakes in Greenland. And so Greenland is obviously not particularly tectonically active, but you can see here these all these red dots here are glacial earthquakes are identified. So these are all coming from Greenland, right? This is not a place where we expect to find a lot of big earthquakes, which makes them interesting on their own. They also had these kind of unusual spectral characteristics. So they're very, very, very long period, right? So what we're looking at here is just a couple traces. So of a similarly sized glacial earthquake and a similarly sized tectonic earthquake. Um, just at two period bands. And what we can basically see is if we look at, I mean, you just gonna say finger quotes short periods here, because five to 25 seconds is not short periods really to most of us, but at periods shorter than 25 seconds, we don't really see anything from the glacial earthquake. So these don't show up on traditional detectors. Uh, but if we look at long periods, we can see that these are just as big as a equivalent size tectonic earthquake. They have nice big surface waves, sometimes big long period body waves. So finally, and looks like my bullet points are missing here, um, we have these unusual seasonal trends that were seen in glacial earthquakes and are still seen. So when you look at glacial earthquakes, if you look at their monthly occurrence, you see that you have this big seasonal signal, right? You have a lot of them in June, July, August, September, October, and then not so many in the first half of the year. And that's not really something you see in tectonic earthquakes, right? They have the same occurrence mostly throughout the year. There's some variation, but not much. Um, and also in this initial paper in 2006, 
we see that they have increased rapidly over time. And again, that's not an effect you expect to see with tectonic earthquakes. And so there's these two temporal trends that identify them as distinct from sort of classical tectonic earthquakes at the same time. So a lot of work has done into, gone into sort of trying to figure out what's going on with these. Um, the initial suspicions were that these were these basal sliding events. And so this is a situation where you have the whole glacier decoupling or a large portion of the glacier decoupling and moving some distance before coming to a stop again. Um, and this is a actually pretty reasonable idea. This has actually been seen in Antarctica with some of the ice streams there. And so it may be not unusual to, or excuse me, may not unreasonable to expect that we would see a similar sort of thing um, in Greenland. But based on some work that Meredith Nettles did, uh, we actually can see, which I'll go into a little bit in a second, we'll see that these aren't actually associated with basal sliding, they're associated with these big calving events. So what calving is, is basically when you have a marine terminating glacier, a glacier that comes into the ocean, a glacier that comes into a lake, uh, in some cases, glaciers do this on dry land. Calving is just when you take a big chunk of ice and break it off the end of the glacier, and so it's no longer part of the glacier. And when this happens when these glaciers in Greenland, as these blocks of ice calve off, they are gravitationally unstable because of their shape, and so they tip over. And as they tip over, they push themselves off of the glacier, they create sort of these forces from hydrodynamic forces as they create suction essentially from trying to move water as they move. And this is the process that actually causes these glacial earthquakes. So it's just happens because of these very large calving events. Uh, and these calving events can be really, really big. They can be up to like a gigaton of ice. So it's a lot of ice breaking off at once. Um, and yeah, so it's a lot of ice. Uh, I remember when I first read this, I was really amazed because um, I grew up near the Cascades, and a lot of the glaciers on the Cascade volcanoes aren't even quite one gigaton. So it's a lot of ice breaking off at once. Okay, and in order to do this, we use data actually from a couple IRIS projects here. So I'm going to give some shout outs to IRIS here for hosting me and then for actually providing this data. So we use the, the global side of our graph network for a lot of this data. So these glacial earthquakes are visible globally, right? So we can actually see these things pretty well up to about 90 degrees away. So a lot of these stations that we have here on this GSN graph are really actually useful to us. So probably that was not the original plan that we didn't think we'd be looking at glaciers when the global seismic graph network was already installed or was, was installed, but here we are, so we're using it now. Uh, IRIS is also a supporter of this project GLSEN, which is the Greenland Ice Sheet Monitoring Network. It has these stations that are a little bit closer in, um, and we've been able to use those as well to provide some more sort of near field and regional constraints um, on the glaciers. And uh, my former colleague and current uh, Kira Olson, who's a grad student at Lamont now, is doing some work with these as well. That should that's pretty cool. Okay, so in order to look at these glacial earthquakes, we just do waveform modeling. So. In order to do that, we create synthetic waveforms and do an inverse problem to see their fit. Uh, and from that, we generate sort of source mechanisms for these events. So we have what we call a centroid single force event, which is different than a CMT, and that it, uh, CMT has you know, these double couples. Uh, whereas the CFF, CSF stands for centroid single force, is just it's a vector force that has an acceleration and a deceleration phase. So it has a location and a direction and then a plunge, which is the direction with respect to the surface of the Earth. And so this is just an example of what, what these waveforms look like. Okay, so what have we learned and what can we continue to learn from this modeling? So first of all, when we generate these source mechanisms, we get much, much better locations. And so this is a figure from a paper I published in 2012. Uh, what you're looking at on the left is uh, several hundred glacial earthquakes um, with their initial locations. So this is what their detector initially places them. You can see they're basically spread all over. You can identify these as probably coming from the coast, but it's not really clear what glacier they'd be coming from. But when you do the source mechanisms for these, 
you can see that they all kind of collapse down onto a few glaciers. So each of these little stacks of dots is actually an individual outlet glacier. And when we continue to do these, we can see that this trend where they there's a with time increase in the numbers of these earthquakes, this is a continuing factor. So that first figure I showed you was from a paper in 2006. So that only went through about here. But since then, uh, we have done source mechanisms for this group here, which you can see we're continuing to get an increase in the number of events with time. So this is a real effect. We've looked at this. It's not a station coverage thing. It's not a, we're getting better data. Um, this is actually a real thing. This is actually numbers are truly increasing. And we can also see that this ha does have a geographic trend. If we look at this in terms of just basically breaking down East Greenland versus West Greenland, so just looking at the different coasts, um, we can see that they have different trends. So there's different factors apparently affecting what's happening uh, on East Greenland and West Greenland, particularly after 2005, um, where West Greenland really accelerates and really continues to increase, uh, whereas East Greenland sort of drops back down and doesn't really have this huge, this huge number growth anymore. Uh, one other way to look at this is instead of looking at these bar graphs is to say, okay, where are these events actually coming from? And so if we're look, we here's three maps of Greenland. This is broken out of three time periods. Um, each of these dots is centered on a major outlet glacier with the size scaled by the number of events. And so sort of when the oldest of these we detect in the 90s, we can see they're predominantly coming from these big glaciers in East Greenland and then from Jakob Sabin, which is this guy right here. So Jakob Sabin is um, kind of everybody's favorite Greenland glacier. It's really well studied. There's a lot of lot, lot known and a lot unknown about it, but it's been the subject of a lot of study. It's the biggest glacier in Greenland. And then from these two glaciers, Kangerlussuaq and Helheimer, which are big East Greenland glaciers. And so those are the ones that are dominating uh, glacial earthquake production in the 90s. Uh, if we look into 2000 to 2005, we can see that those glaciers are continuing to dominate production with the exception of uh, Jakob Sabin here, which has an interesting story to it, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But we also see that these glaciers in northwest Greenland have started to produce glacial earthquakes where they didn't before. So there was a few in northwest Greenland in the 90s, but basically there wasn't much happening there. But once we hit 2000, all of a sudden there's a bunch of glacial earthquakes there. Uh, and that trend continues into 2006 to 2010, and I don't have this figure updated, but it has continued as, as far as we know through 2013, which is the most recent uh, glacial earthquake data that's published, um, that these glaciers in northwest Greenland are really, really coming to almost dominate the production of glacial earthquakes. So they were quiet before, um, and then after 2000s, they kind of turn on and become much more active. Sorry, I lost my cursor here, I gotta quit. Okay, so another way to look at that, this is through this kind of strange chart that I've, I've made, but it works because the coast of West Greenland is almost due north-south. So what we're looking at here is latitude versus time, where each of these little dots is a glacial earthquake. Um, on the right here, I've labeled each of these latitudes with the glacier that is at that latitude. And so what we can see here is that we sort of have this effect where glaciers in Northwest Greenland are sort of progressively sort of turning on, as we say, as you go farther north. So you see these two glaciers rink and Jakobshaven have intermittent production for a long time. But as you go north of that, these glaciers sort of more time passes, the farther north these glaciers are sort of turning on, right? They don't do anything for years and years ahead of time. And then all of a sudden they just turn on and we have glacial earthquakes happening all the time. Uh, Kong Oscar Glacier is sort of the most obvious example of this. It's actually probably one of the largest producers in Greenland now, but prior to about 2001, it didn't really do anything at all. So this glacier has sort of had an on or an off switch. So I've given you all these trends and what we discover about these. So what are these actually, what is this actually telling us about 
the dynamics, right? So what are these glacial earthquakes actually telling us about these glaciers? You know, this would be the ultimately what we would want to know. So I mentioned Kong Oster Glacier, and this is a picture of Kong Oster Glacier here. So this is a glacier in Northwest Greenland. I'll actually flip back for a second, show you which one we're talking about. Um, it's this big cyan circle right here. So if you look at, go through and look at a bunch of Landsat images or look at a bunch of Modix images, whatever your taste is, uh, Kong Oscar, you'll notice this pretty distinct change. So prior to about 2001 or 2002, it had this big floating tongue. Um, it's not fully captured in this picture, but you used to have this ice field that kind of came out here that was all connected. Um, but then when it was doing that, you can see that it was, when it was calving, this is when it was breaking off icebergs, all these icebergs were sitting upright and kind of floating away. Um, we can tell that if we look at this image, you can see, see this sort of pattern on the top of the icebergs here. It looks like the glacier, right? You can see the crevasse patterns. You can see basically like this iceberg just broke off and sort of floated along its merry way. But we look in 2005, which is after this glacier started producing glacial earthquakes, we see something different with most of the, many of the icebergs, not all of them, but many of them. Particularly if you look at this iceberg here, this iceberg here, this iceberg here, some of these down here, you'll notice that you don't see this crevasse pattern on top of them. And this is because you're looking actually at the side of the iceberg. The iceberg has tipped over and fallen over um, as it's calved. And it's this tipping over process that is what causes the glacial earthquake. So you can actually see this change or excuse me, you actually expect this change in what the glacier is doing, this change in its dynamics when it starts producing glacial earthquakes. And so it's not as if these glaciers weren't calving before they produce glacial earthquakes. Essentially, every glacier that empties into the ocean is going to calve, or the ocean will be filled with ice, right? I mean, they have to calve eventually. Um, but what glacial earthquakes are telling us is that something has changed about what's happening with the calving. Um, and what we think that is, is that we believe that these glaciers only have these toppling blocks or these sort of overturning blocks when they're very near to grounded. Um, and what that means is that in many glaciers, uh, especially ones that in Northern Greenland, a lot of glaciers in Antarctica, they have a large floating tongue of ice. So this glacier flows down through its valley, it's touching the ground as it flows through the valley. But once it hits the ocean, it has this place called the grounding line, which is where the it stops being in contact with the ground, and the glacier itself extends a long ways beyond that, kilometers and kilometers, sometimes hundreds of kilometers beyond that. And so you have this essentially float, you have floating ice that's sort of protecting the front of the glacier. So you have floating ice that's extending a significant distance beyond, beyond the grounding line. And when you lose that floating ice, when all that floating ice is gone, is when you have what we call a grounded glacier. And that's where or we sometimes say near grounded glacier. And that's what you have when the glacier's terminus, the very end of the glacier, is very close to the point where the glacier is touching the ground. So oftentimes there's like a kilometer or so, there's a very small amount of floating ice in front of it, uh, which is actually turns out to be important for generating these, but there's very, very little protecting ice. So essentially, once you've lost all of your floating ice, you start to produce glacial earthquakes. Um, and we can actually see that at a couple other glaciers. And so uh, this is this nice paper by Kira Olson. So what we're looking at here is the time history of number of glacial earthquakes for six glaciers in Greenland. Um, and what I want to particularly draw your attention to um, are these at Kangerlussuaq, Jakobsavn, Kong Oscar, and Allison. You see these gaps that are filled in with gray. And these gray gaps are periods of time during which the glacier's tongue was floating, right? So it wasn't grounded. So you had a lot of ice between the grounding line and the terminus of the glacier. Um, and during those time periods, we don't see that these glaciers produced any glacial earthquakes. Uh, Jakobsavn is probably the most interesting case here because it was sort of anchored on these rocks um, in the late 2000, excuse me, in the late 90s. Um, and it produced glacial earthquakes at that time. And then after that, it retreated beyond these rocks. And so it was no longer grounded. Uh, and it stopped producing glacial earthquakes again until about 2005. Um, the one exception everybody always notices here is that Helheim Glacier in 2006, 
Uh, and Helheim had its really, really large retreat in 2005, which is associated with this year of much, excuse me, a lot of glacial earthquakes. And it was actually floating for most of 2006. It only sort of re-retreated to its grounding line um, in very, very late 2006. And that's when that glacial earthquake occurred. So it was floating for much of the summer um, as soon as it regrounded, or not as soon as, but after it regrounded, it produced a glacial earthquake. So we see that these glacial earthquakes are essentially telling us the grounding state of these glaciers. Um, and so that's a good thing to know because that can be hard to identify from afar. Um, and this is telling us what's happening with that. All right. So, oh, the slide got lost here. But so we do see rapidly retreating glaciers that don't produce glacial earthquakes when they're floating at the terminus. Um, an example of this is this glacier, Allison Glacier. Um, it's actually, it's period of fastest retreat we didn't actually see any glacial earthquakes. Um, then it slowed down, its retreat slowed down, and it started producing glacial earthquakes because it was grounded at that time. So even very, very rapidly retreating glaciers don't really do anything until they're grounded, until their, their terminuses are basically on the ground. And we only see these glacial earthquakes occurring at glaciers that we can identify as being grounded when we go and look at them in detail. Um, and otherwise, the sort of trends in these glacial earthquakes do mirror other observed glacier dynamic changes. So when glaciers accelerate, we see more glacial earthquakes as we see more calving in order for that, that flux to balance out. So these glacial earthquakes are a little bit of a proxy for what's going on with these larger scale things at the glaciers. Um, but the glacial earthquakes themselves, so each individual glacial earthquake, and we consider them as a whole, do have something to tell us when we look at the sort of variations in the source parameters of these earthquakes. Um, and so what we're looking at here is just a picture of Helheim Glacier. This is in East Greenland. Um, each of these dots is a glacial earthquake. Each of the arrows associated with the dot is its force azimuth. So this is the direction of the force that's associated with the glacial earthquake. Um, so we would expect this to essentially be perpendicular to the glacier's uh, terminus because the iceberg is pushing itself off the terminus. Um, and then we see a large number of digitized calving fronts that are plotted here as well. And these colors just correspond to different groups of years. Um, so red is the first group, uh, blue is the second group, then green, and then purple. And so when we actually look at these source parameters in detail, we see a significant amount of variation. Um, the most dramatic of which is if we look at Helheim Glacier again, if we look at this force orientation over time, we see this pretty dramatic change that happens in about 2005 to 2006, um, where prior to this time period, we had much, much sort of lower numbers. So the active force orientation was closer to 90 degrees. Um, and after this time period, it's closer to 120 or 130 degrees. And so that's a pretty dramatic change. Um, but we don't, didn't really know sort of how accurate or like the precision or sort of how reliable these active force azimuths were, right? Um, but this is a pretty dramatic thing. And so this sort of just excuse me, stood out at us for a couple of reasons. So first of all, um, you know, we want to see a big step like this. We want to figure out why it is. Um, also, it turns out in 2005, uh, the events prior to that, the solutions were generated by Victor Tsai. Um, and after that, they're generated by me. So we were said, okay, is Victor doing something different than I am? And so we looked at all this and no, essentially, is the question. So we think this is a real trend and that there's not something instrumental or something going on here. So these numbers, are actually changing. Whether that actually means anything about the glacier then is what we want to find out. And so ideally we would like to have really, really, really good satellite coverage and we could go in and look at the glacier every time it produces a glacial earthquake and say, what does the glacial terminus look like at that time? But unfortunately that doesn't really work out so well. There's not that many times when we can actually really precisely identify the exact part of the glacier where the glacial earthquake came from. However, uh, there is this glacial earthquake that occurred at Jakobshavn, uh, and this one has actually been the source of several studies. There's a couple papers actually on this uh, glacial earthquake in particular. Um, and here, the source region has been very well identified 
um, in a previous paper. And so what we're looking at here is this yellow line here is the digitized calving front from uh, August 14th, 20, 2009, excuse me. Um, the image is from the 23rd of August. And during that time period, there was a glacial earthquake. And so Fabian Walter has identified this is the section which is missing um, between those time periods. This is where the glacial earthquake came from. And so if we actually measure the angle of this part of the calving front right here, it turns out it's 116 degrees, or the perpendicular to it is 116 degrees. So pointing that way is 116 degrees. Um, and if we look at the force orientation from Beach and Nettles 2012, then it's 119 degrees. So at least in this one example, we're seeing that the angles we're getting from these teleseismic source parameters are matching at least pretty well what the actual source area is. Um, and so what I did is digitize a bunch of calving fronts, uh, measured the angles of them, and I plotted them up here. And so there's a lot of dots on this, and so I'm going to kind of walk you guys through this. Um, when we look at this, here's four glaciers. So here's Helheim, uh, Kong Oster, Kangerluzwak, and Jakobsawen. These are the four biggest glaciers, the bit four largest producers of glacial earthquakes in Greenland. Um, in places where there are gaps, such as right here at Kong Oster, or here at Jakobsawen, this is just because the glacier wasn't producing glacial earthquakes at the time. And so in an effort to cut down the work on this a little bit, we didn't digitize the cavity fronts for that time period. Uh, each of these little yellow triangles is the active force azimuth of a glacial earthquake. Um, so you can see again that Jakob Savin turns, excuse me, Kong Oscar turns on about 2002. Uh, Jakob Savin turns off for this time period. So each of those is actually the orientation we've derived from a glacial earthquake. Um, and then we have these red, these blue, and these green dots. And so it turns out because the terminus of a glacier is oftentimes very curved, it's difficult to tell, to so, sort of a identify one number for the sort of angle or the orientation of that terminus. Um, it's like trying to say, what's the angle of, you know, you can't say the angle of a curve. You can say two ends of it, but that ends up being not very effective. So what I, what I did is broke the terminus into two sections and then measured the northern and southern or northern and eastern section and got the orientation of that. And that was sort of a trade-off between saying, how do you want to completely represent this calving front? And how do we want to actually have useful data? Because we want to you know, have a, a useful number of angles that actually have meaning, meaningful. So we took the two largest sections of the calving front and measured them. Um, and in some cases, though, it was basically flat or it was very well represented by one number. And so that's what the green dots are. So if you see, Red and blue, that's two halves of the calving front. If you see green, that's where it was flat. Um, and basically, it doesn't change so much, or it's basically flat all the way across the front. Um, and so we did this for four different glaciers. Um, for here, I'm just going to focus on Helheim, because this is where we saw this interesting trend um, in the active force orientations from the earthquakes. And so if we just look at the calving front orientations for Helheim, we see that this trend that we can see in the glacial earthquakes is somewhat mirrored in the orientation from the glacier, but it's a little bit subdued or it's a little bit mellowed. We can see that in the 90s and early 2000s, we don't see many calving front orientations over 120 degrees, but uh, in later time periods we do. But the change there is not so dramatic. Um, there's not this big sort of almost like step like that we saw in uh, the orientations themselves. But the fact that these do match pretty well sort of confirms that at least these numbers we're getting um, are actually probably representative of the angles of the, the glacier. So what we actually notice here is that prior to about 2005, you can see that most of the glacial earthquake azimuths are pretty close to the southern section of the glacier, the sort of southern half of the glacier. Whereas after 2005, they matched much better than the northern part of the glacier. And so this is actually very interesting to us because we don't have this data from prior to 2005, but after 2005, um, 
there was this great study by Murray et al. And what we're looking at here is a camera view looking north across Helheim Glacier. So here's the terminus here. And what we're looking at is the vertical displacement in the glacier at a given time. And what we see in this picture and what they found in this paper is that on the northern half of the glacier, sort of north of a medial moraine, which is roughly right through here, we see the generation of large overturning toppling blocks. Um, and this is visualized here by the formation of the scarp here, which represents where you're going to have a calving event, and the uplift of this section here as this block is sort of being wedged and pried away by hydrodynamic forces. And so what we can see is from this study, or what this study saw is that this is only really happening on the northern half of Helheim right now. And so we don't really have that again, we don't have this data from prior to 2005, but when we look at our orientations again, we can say, okay, we're only really seeing glacial earthquake orientations that match the northern section of the glacier very well. So we do have some evidence of that, or we do have some sort of thing that happens to, this matches what we see at the glacier. I'm sorry, I'm sort of stumbling over this, but we see that we're only actually really seeing now calving events yeah, of this type coming from the northern half of Helheim, which matches the data we're getting from these um, sort of globally generated force mechanisms. So that's pretty cool. Uh, finally, and I wouldn't recommend using this as primary, the primary way to track position changes. If we actually look at the position changes of these glacial earthquakes over time, they also move as the glacier moves. And so what we're looking at here is these uh, pentagons are the mean position of glacial earthquakes over time with some standard errors, um, whereas the these bars here are positions generated from actually measuring calving fronts. So again, this isn't perfect, and I, there's much, much better ways to track the position of glaciers using satellite imagery, but the positions are actually sufficiently meaningful that they do follow the glacier. So when you see the glacier retreat, you do see an inward motion of the position. So again, not the best way to track positions, but it just is going to show you that these source mechanisms we generate are actually have useful information in them. All right, so we have this calving model of seismogenesis that matches all the glacial earthquakes we've seen in Greenland. Um, at least one glacier, Helheim, we see uh, field evidence that we're only having glacial earthquakes in the northern half. This matches what we're getting from our solutions. Um, and we see these glacial earthquakes only occurring at near ground to termini. So these glacial earthquakes are forming a way to inform us of the grounding state of these glaciers. Um, these glacial earthquakes, their force orientations are consistent with physical changes in the shapes of the source glaciers. And so when you have a change in the, the shape of your calving front, then you have a change in the orientations of your glacial earthquakes. And if you're changing your terminus shape, you're probably changing something about the dynamics of the glacier, and so it can be an informative and useful thing to have. Um, our variations in glacial earthquake location are actually consistent with true variations in the source position. There's a lot of noise in there, and you don't want to use glacial earthquakes to determine your glacial location, but it matches and it's usable. Um, and so this really sort of is forming the background of using, or the sort of, we hope the building blocks of using glacial earthquakes um, as a way to remote sense or to use another remote sensing tool um, for the Greenland ice sheet. And so um, just with the time I have left here, uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly about uh, what sort of one of these glaciers looks like in the local sense um, and sort of local seismicity, right? So what can we actually learn about glaciers from putting seismometers around the glaciers themselves? Um, and this is where a lot of people are doing a lot of work that I'm not going to have a chance to cover. And it's it's a very growth field. And I'm really excited to see lots of people embracing seismom, se excuse me, seismology as a way to look at glaciers. So just a sort of quick overview of some work that should be submitted soon. Um, is looking at this temporary network from 2009 that was put around Helheim Glacier. Um, and so we had six stations. Uh, these are all on solid rock. Um, the glacier itself is not really uh, conducive to putting seismometers on. 
Uh, you can't really tell in this image because there's a cloud, but this one is actually on a noon attack, so everything is on solid rock here. Uh, and so what I'm going to mainly talk about today is these three stations here, but I'll give you a little bit of a quick overview um, of what's going on. So as you would probably expect, you get lots and lots of seismic signals at these glaciers. So here's just five minutes of seismic records, and you can see that at both sort of if we divide the glacier into two environments, up glacier and near the terminus, um, we can see there's a lot of things happening at, in both places. There's a lot of seismic signals occurring in these places. Um, if we look at the rate or how many of these seismic signals we see per hour, uh, again, we see up several hundred up to 300 per hour in some places at some times um, at these different stations. Um, and most notably, we see this very distinct, again, difference between what's happening near the terminus and what's happening farther away from the glacier. So these three stations, one, two, and three, show one type of signal. These stations, four, five, and six, show something different. And these are actually from different parts of the glacier. So four, five, and six are up here. Uh, one, two, and three are down here. So we see different parts of the glacier have different seismic environments. So we're probably looking at things that are very, very local to these stations. We're probably not looking at events, or most of the events we're seeing are probably not occurring and being viewed all the way across the glacier. They're probably occurring very, very close um, to their stations. And so if we zoom in again on these down glacier stations here, uh, one, two, and three, we see something kind of interesting about these signals. And so there's this sort of background slow variation at these glacier, at of sort of the rate of seismicity at this glacier, but we see this much, much faster trend here. So we see this um, sort of rapid oscillation up and down, up and down, in the number of events that are occurring. And so what what is this? So what's the source of this? Um, so, oh, just to, Step back for a second. My slides got out of order here. I apologize again. Uh, this is just the location of some of these events. Um, these are generated using the assumption that they are surface waves, which uh, by every method we can test they are, um, and using the assumed velocity models. So this is a very, very simple location. Um, and each of these events is pretty crummy looking, but if we look at these in sort of summation, we can see that most of them, they're all coming from very, very close to the calving front. So that's just to convince you that these are actually coming from the glacier. But I'm going to go back to my trend here. So we look at this trend, and it, it turns out that this short period oscillation in the number of events is actually related to the tide. It's a semi diurnal signal. And it's in a way that consistently is out of phase with the tides. And so when your tides are high, you have low numbers of seismicity. When your tides are high, excuse me, when your tides are low, you have high numbers of seismicity. So it's this inverted signal. Um, that there's essentially no lag in. And so here I've flipped the tidal signal up and upside down um, and shown you the detections every 10 minutes uh, from one of these stations. And it's basically in phase to about five minutes or something. The lag is very, very low. So there these are very, very close to perfectly in phase. And so we see this tightly generated seismicity, or this tightly modulated seismicity, that's happening very, very, very near to the front of the glacier. And so what's causing this is if we look at some GPS data from a different year, actually, from Helheim, but we've this seems to be pretty consistent across a couple different studies, is that as the tides go down, you see this stretching in the glacier. And so that's what this admittance is. It's just the amount of stretching you have. And so near, very near the terminus of the glacier, you see the glaciers essentially stretching out like a slinky. And we think that's being accommodated by increased seismicity. Um, when the tides are high, the glacier's terminus is essentially compacted or its motion is retarded re re excuse me, relative to the rest of the motion. And we still have a lot of sort of cracking and crevassing because this thick glacier is so damaged already. But it's not as much as when the tide's down and stretching it out. So there's going to be much more details in this. This is forthcoming soon. Um, it's pretty neat, and I've 
done a couple talks on this. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, so just as I'm running out of time here, so just our implications for glacier dynamics on this is that we have our local seismicity is at a maximum during periods of high longitudinal strain at Helheim Glacier. And we think that this brittle failure and brittle crevassing that we're seeing the, causing these sort of small micro ice quakes during the tides may actually be important in helping to coalesce cracks for large scale failure to occur. So obviously these aren't causing the major calving events. We think that they may play a role in sort of damaging the glacier to a sufficient extent that it can fail. Um, and so these tidal fluctuations help promote failure of the calving front, the longitudinal stretching. So essentially your tides are helping to break up these glaciers. Oh, and I forgot to mention this, I apologize. Let me go back here. Um, so the other thing that we see here is this green line is the timing of a glacial earthquake. And so we see a perturbation in this trend following glacial earthquakes. So at one of the stations, it drops pretty rapidly. At another station, it there's this huge spike followed by a decline. But we see this interplay between glacial earthquakes um, and the small scale seismicity. And it, basically decreases in the long term. So if you go about several days after a glacial earthquake, the number of small scale failures as occurring as ice quakes has been reduced significantly. So we think that there's some interplay here between, we think that these glacial earthquakes are affecting this crevassing and the crevassing may be affecting the glacial earthquakes. So just some quick conclusions. Uh, Greenland Outlet glaciers, you're gonna see abundant seismic emissions, right? So you see this on the local scale, you see this on global scale. Um, the source parameters from these global glacial earthquakes are actually closely linked to glacier dynamics, so they're actually usable for telling you some things about glacier dynamics. Uh, at the local scale, you see the seismicity being tidally modulated at Helheim, um, and there's been a couple other glaciers where people have seen tidally modulated seismicity. Uh, some glaciers where people, the seismicity doesn't seem to be so tidally affected. So one thing I think moving forward is to figure out what's different about these different glaciers in Greenland. Um, so Glacial earthquakes are seasonally modulated due to the ice front cycle. So you're advancing in the winter because you have colder temperatures, you have frozen ice in the fjord that's sort of holding the glacier together. In the summer, this all melts out and you see more capping, more glacial earthquakes. Um, so the big takeaway here is that these interactions are really important. Glacial earthquakes can tell you a lot. Uh, in the short time scale, you need to be concerned about the ocean. Um, and I just want to people to be interested and excited about uh, seismic signals. So I think they have a lot to tell us about what's going on at these glaciers. Uh, and that's it, thanks. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, so just a reminder to enter your questions into the questions chat box um, in the window on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, I have a quick question though. Um, uh, like I think the, uh, the work that you're doing with tides is super cool. Um, I was actually wondering what uh, tidal signals you're actually looking at. Is, are you looking at a combination between the ocean tidal height and the solid earth tide, or are you looking at- Oh, it's only, it's ocean tides we're concerned about. Okay. So, it's only, so it's only ocean tides. Um, and the plot I showed you is from a model, but we've, it's been, val uh, it's been validated in another paper. So it's essentially the model is accurate for here. Okay, great. Um, and that gave ample time for lots of questions to come in. Well, the first is just a, like a comment saying great seminar from Luciana Astiz. Thanks, Luciana. Um, Amanda Price asks, um, are there any calving events that you see on local seismic networks that are not detected in the teleseismic method? Yeah, so one of the things that, um, so in that last set of plots I actually showed you, I mean, that's, so that's a comp, so yes with a caveat. So we see the green line that I very briefly touched on, this is calving event that occurred during this 2009 deployment was actually not detected um, by the global detector. So it's not actually, if you go and look at my paper from 2012 that has all these solutions, it's actually not in there because it was too small to set up the global detector. And so we sort of had to go back and comb through it manually um, to pick those up. And so that's just talking about the, this one type of calving event, which are, essentially seismogenic capsizing calving events. And so, yes, we do see ones regionally and locally that don't show up 
on the global scale. Um, in terms of other types of calving events, so there's a whole bunch of different modes of calving, and um, as we're going to see tons of those, right? So you have sometimes ice sloughing, sometimes ice kind of coming off in these slow landslides, um, or landslide is a bad phrase, but these sort of sloughing events where it's a bunch of sort of broken up ice falling off the glacier. These things are all calving events too, and we don't see those when we talk about glacial earthquakes. So glacial earthquakes only represent this one mode of calving. Um, and all these other modes of calving can be seen much better locally, um, just because they're not giant masses of ice that are causing huge displacements on the earth. And so there's a lot of really nice studies from Alaska. There's a couple of really nice studies uh, from Jakobsov and looking at these sort of smaller scale calving processes. Um, So yes, I guess is the answer. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thanks. Um, Steve Malone asks, what are the mechanisms of the local seismicity? So for this paper, we, or for this paper that's forthcoming, we've been assuming that the majority of the mechanisms for local seismicity is going to be uh, surface crevasse opening. Um, there's a couple, it's a, it's a, we're basically basing this on the fact that this glacier is very, very crevassed. Um, there's some, Pretty nice studies from uh, other parts of Greenland and from the Swiss Alps that look at what you essentially expect to see in terms of phases from different types of, or some different depths of ice quakes. Um, with, in most cases, you essentially only see surface waves from crevassing, um, and you essentially, I apologize, I'm greatly simplifying this for these those who have done a lot more work on this than I did. Uh, but you essentially see body waves very well from deeper events and surface waves very well from shallower events. And we don't see any body waves for the local seismicity in the near terminus region. Um, part of that might be signals and noise issues, but we think at least the majority of these near terminus small ice quakes are crevasse opening or crevasse growth. So mode one cracks. Great, thanks. Um, Akram asks, um, how are you determining the distance from the calving front to the grounding line, uh, i.e. like locating the grounding line? So um, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. You can do it if you have GPS, you essentially, if you have a bunch of GPS sensors, um, you can take a GPS sensor and if it's going up and down with the tides, it's on floating ice, if it's essentially vertically, not responding to the tides and it's on the ground. Um, there's also some sort of clues we can see in some images. So um, I'm gonna flip way back here. Uh, actually, this might be in this image here. So in this image here, you can kind of see this line going across Helheim right here. Um, this is basically analogous to a fault scarp. And oftentimes these are associated with the grounding line or very near to the grounding line. And that's where you have flexure on the, this down sort of down glacier that this part is flexing up and down with the tides, this part isn't. And so you're sort of starting to develop essentially what's analogous to a fault scarp there. And so um, that's a little bit um, hard to see sometimes. And it's probably not accurate to meters but it's probably pretty accurate to tens to hundreds of meters and so that's one way to see where the uh, grounding line is um, then gps or if you have repeat repeat altitude measurements from radar or lidar or something like that you can do it there as well um, so if i go back again sorry i'll flip way back here so if you have something like this where you have repeat photogrammetry or something like this you can also see it if you see a different vertical signal uh, above and below the grounding line. So hopefully that's a useful answer. Great, thanks. Um, John Robert Schultz asks, um, good talk. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, gosh, sorry, Steve. Could glacial earthquakes also signify the scratching of already calved ice along the ocean bottom? So that almost undoubtedly produces a seismic signal, but um, if you look at I think the best analog to that is probably ice scraping against other ice. And Doug McHale has a paper on that 
from uh, some icebergs in Antarctica, and that's a very, very high frequency signal. Um, and so one of the sort of defining characteristics of those glacial earthquakes is that they're very, very low frequency. So the time that we use in the model to estimate the cap size of these earthquakes is essentially close to a minute, so it's 50 seconds. Um, and we essentially don't see any signal from the glacial earthquakes at any period, at globally at least, any period shorter than 25 seconds. And so when these things are capsizing, undoubtedly they scrape against all sorts of things, but this the that's just not going to produce a source that's that long. And I think it's similar if you had a already detached iceberg that was shoaling or something or grinding itself along the ground, that would probably produce a lot of noise, high frequency noise, if you were close by, but on the global scale, you just can't see it. Okay, great. Um, you might have already answered this a little bit, but Sun Young Park asks, um, has there been any basal sighting events detected? Uh, we, in terms of stuff that's going on in Greenland uh, at the like glacial earthquake scale, there's none of those that we can say are basal sliding events. Um, it's possible a small percentage of the local ice quakes may be related to basal sliding. We haven't ruled that out. Um, but like I said, I think the majority of the local events are uh, surface crevassing. Maybe some tiny, tiny fraction of them is very, very small basal stick slip. Um, but none of the glacial earthquakes in Greenland are, as far as we know and as far as we can tell, and this has been reasonably thoroughly investigated, uh, are from sort of large scale stick slip or basal sliding. Great, thanks. Um, Susan Schwartz asks, um, do you have a model for why the glacial earthquakes only occur when the calving region is grounded? So somebody who's a, who's a better ice ocean interactions person than me could maybe give a better explanation as to exactly why this is. Um, but our understanding has always been that if you have um, a large floating tongue, that a lot of your crevassing is going to be in terms of these icebergs that just sort of detach and sort of placidly float away. They're sort of nice and wide, and so they don't tip over. Um, when we look at satellite images, we do definitely see some overturning bergs um, at floating tongues from time to time. And I think that the reason we don't see those creating glacial earthquakes is just a question of coupling. I think that the it's not really when they capsize off of a large floating tongue, they just it's just not as well coupled into the solid earth, and so we just don't see it. And so um, why exactly the floating bergs tend to capsize from a floating tongue, um, I think this has to do with where the fractures develop. Why that kind of berg doesn't happen in a grounded glacier is just because it's grounded, right? So you can't have ice just float away. It has to, if it's wider than it is, if it can't fall over, it's just still grounded, right? It's not going to float away from the glacier. So I, th I, I think that answers the question, although I sort of, I, th I think it's a reasonable question to ask. And I think that, yeah, before I just ramble for at, at ages, I think that's that. <laughs> okay. um, Pauline asks, um, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, sh uh, she wonders if we could go back to the plot of the one at all uh, in prep. Um, and if you could tell us a bit more about the data that's plotted, like uh, what like the y-axis, the long flow in minutes means, and how was that calculated, if, if you know? Um, so I didn't, so how exactly it was calculated, I can't tell you, as I'm not a co-author on this paper. Um, but what we're essentially looking at is if you we're looking at GPS, uh, like on glacier GPS deployment, and so what's essentially observed is that you can take the long-term trend in terms of motion of the glacier and subtract that out. And you'll look and you what you get is at each individual station, you essentially get a semi-diurnal sinusoid where the glacier accelerates at low tides and decelerates at high tides. Uh, and that signal is stronger very near to the terminus and it's very weak farther from the terminus. And so this is essentially just looking at 
what fraction of the overall motion it is. And so sort of how large that signal is um, with why we have this in the, or why I have this in this presentation is that uh, you see the glacier stretching out at low tides quite a bit uh, near the terminus, but essentially not so much uh, farther away from the terminus, which is to sort of explain why we don't see tidally modulated seismicity 10 kilometers from the glacier's terminus, but we see it at the glacier terminus. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much, Steve. That's the end of our questions, and we're getting near to the end of our hour, too. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thanks to the audience for all of your great questions, and uh, stay tuned. Our next webinar will take place on March 14th, and uh, Sue Huff is our presenter from the USGS in Pasadena, California, so um, stay tuned for that. Um, thanks again, Steve, and I wish everyone a great rest of their day. All right, bye, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.